I'm Lachlan McLean from Beer Cartel, here with your regular fill of the latest insights, interviews and news from the craft beer world. Thanks for joining me again right here on The Inside Word. Welcome everyone to episode 3 of The Inside Word. In this episode, we chat to Pete Gillespie, co-founder and head brewer of New Zealand craft brewing giant's Garage Project, about their meteoric rise from a tiny microbrewery to working side by side with some of the world's best breweries. Welcome, Pete. Thanks for joining us. What's What are you up to at the moment? What's the plans? Zoom down uh, from RO. So we've got two sites now in Wellington. Yep. Um, we've got the RO Garage, which, you know, was, was the birthplace of the Garage Project. Uh, and then literally a little five-minute drive or 10-minute walk, sometimes you can walk it faster than drive it, uh, is Marion Street, which is right in the heart of Wellington itself. And that's where we do all of our weird fermentation for the wild workshop. The two are separated for good reason, so that <laughs> no infections, crop contamination. Yeah. So if you've been working down here in the wild workshop, um, getting beer on you and anything, then it is forbidden for you to go back to RO that day. Go home and then we get be decontaminated. We need to get yeah. one of those fucking cool things you see in the space movies where. <laughs> The airlocks. That's right. You just you go in naked and somebody sprays you with a massive hose or something. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, now I think of it, we might, we might do one of those. That'd be that'd be worth it. <laughs> um, you're obviously at the Wild Workshop at the moment, um, but yeah. you have been brewing a long time. So Garage Project's been open since what 2011 now. Um, 2011. Yes. Yeah, so we started released our first beers in 2011. So obviously there was you know a fair bit of. Um, of work went into it before we actually opened. Anyone, you, anyone who's involved in opening a brewery will know that it's a it's a pretty long process. Absolutely. Um, in 2011, we, we started there. Um, but before that, no, I, I brewed at other breweries previously to that. Yeah, so you've, you've been a brewery for a lo- brewer for a long time now. Um, where were yeah, you before yeah. that? I brewed originally. I started brewing in the UK. Um, yep. So I brewed. My very first brewing job was at Breakspears, which was this wonderful... Um, traditional real ale brewery on the banks of the Thames in Henley on Thames, um, just kind of real chocolate box stuff. It was built in that kind of time period where people made industrial architecture beautiful. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, absolutely. Stained up windows, oak, copper, uh, little winding, twisty staircases. It was just the most beautiful. Building. And, and those um, beers are definitely uh, in a complete contrast to what you're brewing right now, I'd imagine. I know. It's kind of funny, isn't it? I, to be honest, don't brew anything like that anymore. Not that I don't like that beer, but I think that I feel quite strongly that if you really – like I really love English real ale, but I really love it when I'm in England. It's time and place for I'm everything. It. Exactly. It's like, you know, I mean, some of the best pints of beer I've ever had probably in England, you know, it's just the planets align, you're in the right place with a really fresh, beautiful beer, probably with the right people, and you're just like, holy shit, this is just the most. Yeah, the that's that's beer. where it really works. Um, it is, you went, you, sorry, you went from England and then you came over our way and you spent some time in Australia? Yeah, so I brewed at a couple of breweries in England uh, and then back to Australia where I've been living previously and brewed at the Malt Shovel in yep. Sydney. At the Camperdown Brewery? Yeah, which was a great experience. I mean, there were a fantastic bunch of brewers there. Um, you know, Chuck is a Chuck is a legend. Um, yeah, we. I think the Australian industry owes him a lot, um, and uh, even Garage Project, I think, might own him something with uh, a lot of yourself going through there. It was pretty interesting. I, uh, he is a real character. I was last time I was in Sydney, I was um down on Coogee Beach, and it was like it was pretty stormy. The sea was pretty wild. I was like, whoa, look at this. And then suddenly out of the surf strides this character in his budgie smugglers. And it's fucking <laughs> Chuck. It's like he's out there. I don't know how old is Chuck now, but he's just he's out there just swimming backwards Still and forwards across Coogee Bay. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, good on him. So you went from the malt shovel back over to uh, – into New Zealand. I remember yeah, to, your, myself. More, I, I, to be honest, I, I, I was trying to set up a little brewery in the Blue Mountains for a while. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so I was living up in Katoomba and commuting down to the malt shovel and trying to set up the brewery up in the Blue Mountains. But um, the, I, I hope, I, I believe things have changed now in New South Wales, which is fantastic. But at the time, the bureaucracy was just 
yeah. so mind-boggling. I don't think in my life I'd ever come across something before where there was no outside the box. It was just box, and there was no Black way out. It was yeah. a frustrating experience. It, yeah, it is getting better. Yeah, which is fantastic. So, I mean, I'd been trying for three years, basically, to get this wow. brewery up and running, and I was just, in the end, I was like, you know what, this is this is just masochistic now, banging my head against a brick wall. And it, it was interesting. I'd been over to visit my brother, Ian, who lived in, yep. in Wellington. And I, Wellington's a fascinating city. I mean, I'd, I'd lived in Wellington when I was younger. Um, and at the time, 57% of all the craft beer in New Zealand was consumed in Wellington. Wow. So, which, considering the size of the population, is remarkable. And especially considering the fact that there really weren't any breweries here. Max, which is a Lion Nathan owned brewery, Max had a brewery here in Wellington and Lion Nathan took it out, like pulled the brewery out, moved the brewing somewhere else. And I, I heard about this when I was over in the malt shop. I'm like, bloody hell, you know, that's Wellington's this amazing market. And as far as I knew, with no breweries in the city itself. So I kind of came over to visit Ian and we snooped around and I asked a lot of people. I was like, why are there no breweries here? And no one could give me a good answer. And I went to the council, being obviously quite shy of bureaucracy by this point, and I was like, would you, would you stop me if I tried to set up a brewery? And they were like, no, we'd love you to, you know, go for it. And I went and saw the customs and excise people and they were like, no, we'd love you to, go for it. Um, and so, yeah, I couldn't find any good reason not to give it a go. So I packed everything in, sold the house in, Australia came over and within, you know, within six months, we had managed to get something going. Wow. Here, I wish we, it was that easy in Australia. Well, yes. I mean, I think Garage is definitely a very different enterprise to what I probably would have set up. Um, so, you know, I did it alongside Joss Ruffle, uh, who one of my brother's kind of best friends, lifelong friend. Um, they were born a couple of houses apart. Yep. in Christchurch where we lived. Um, so I used to babysit the pair of them when I was <laughs> young. Um, so he's effectively family. So Joss was involved in the brewery. His background was computer gaming. Uh, yeah, and right. So nothing to do with brewing, other than the fact that he loved drinking craft beer and he'd been making trips over to the States. And obviously the States were going through that absolute renaissance, you know, 20, yep. 2010, that renaissance of craft brewing were just everything was on the up. Uh, he was super excited by it. And then obviously, so Joss, Ian, myself, um, you know, lots of encouragement from them. Uh, we got the garage going, which was great. So the garage project, um, I'm guessing the brewery name came from the venue, not the other way around. And interesting. We, we, the other day we were talking about this, we had a, we had a list, a long list of um, names that we were thinking of. For the for the brewery, uh, in retrospect, re retrospect, thank Christ we didn't use any of them because they were fucking awful. <laughs> uh, at the top, at the top of the list, like just on the piece of paper, we'd scribbled garage project, just because it was you know we started doing trials in my brother's garage under the house before yep. we made get a site, and then the site that we found was this completely derelict service station slash garage uh, in Arrow Valley, which if anyone knows Wellington, Arrow Valley is this kind of like basically kind of like temperate rainforest valley full of old hippie houses. And it was quite the hippie haven in the 60s and 70s. It's being gently gentrified now. But, um, yeah. you know, it's this little damp Kiwi Valley with this derelict service station. So we moved in there and we were just sitting there, you know, surrounded by rubbish in this derelict place on couch. And we'd scribbled up garage project hated all the names that we came up with and then just went back the next day and looked at garage project on the top of the piece of paper and went, fuck, well, let's just use that. And let's go with that one. Know, it's been great. It so kind of, it, that's it, that's yeah, how garage project came about. That's how it came about. So you opened up um, and you set a pretty ambitious uh, goal. I think you said in the first 24 weeks and that was to brew 24 different beers. Yeah, we were very mindful. In New Zealand is a very interesting place. So even at the time in 2010, 2011, there were a lot of breweries in New Zealand per head of population. So, you know, New Zealand has the population of Sydney kind of mm. spread thinly over it. Um, 
And there are quite a lot of breweries per head of population making really good beer, but they tended to be very true to style. So, you know, everybody would have their, here's up, here's the pale ale, here's the IPA, here's the porter, here's the pilsner. And so we're very mindful we didn't want to just be another brewery because why the fuck would we do that when there were already lots of really good breweries doing that kind of very true to style stuff. Um, so, you know, we, we wanted to do something that was maybe a little different, hopefully a little bit remarkable. Uh, we also had fuck all money. Uh, so, you know, we had this site, this derelict petrol station, um, but we didn't have a lot of money on top of that. So we basically, we bought this 50 litre pilot plant. It was the best kind of homebrew kit we could find yeah. uh, with the money we had. And we shipped that over from the States and set it up in this, in this garage. Um, and the idea was, yeah, six months where we brewed a brand new beer every week. Um, we'd effectively end up with two 20 litre kegs and we teed up with this great craft beer bar downtown called Hashigazaki. Every Tuesday night, we'd take these two kegs of beer down, brand new recipe, brand new beer each week. Uh, and they'd put it on on the taps. At five o'clock, it would go on tap. And um, over the period of that six months, you know, we managed to build up quite a, a cool kind of cult following. People would turn up at the bar. If you weren't there on the night, chances are the beer would run out and you'd never get to try it. Um, so, it, you know, it was pretty cool. I mean, it, we also had in the back of our mind that if it all went fucking to custard, we could all just sort of disappear back into the mist and yeah. maybe yeah. reform and come out again trying something <laughs> else. So it kind of almost like guerrilla brewing. But um, yeah, yeah. You know, it, worked, it worked really well. And it was also obviously a really cool chance to experiment and try lots of, you know, new recipes and new things. I mean, obviously, I'd worked at craft breweries before that, but even at, you know, big craft breweries, you're, you're often just reproducing the same beers over and over again. And there's a real yep. skill to that. And I think it's something that, you know, a lot of people jump from home brewing to a craft brewery, but I've always been very happy that I spent those years in other breweries learning, you know, there's a real skill to that kind of replicating the same thing over and over again and ensuring that, you know, what you're releasing yeah, yeah. it the highest quality but by the same token you know i love doing exciting new things and the 24 was absolutely that you know and it was that, kind of terrifying terrifying because you know, half the time you know we're making such a small quantity of beer i couldn't even you couldn't even have a whole pint of it before you took it down you were taking this beer down and almost be you know trying it properly for the first time especially with experimental stuff that was um yeah we we had these little coasters where people would um fill out it said you know what did you drink what did you think and people could like fill it out and say what they thought of the beer so you obviously needed a pretty thick skin um yeah, yeah. because you know real real craft beer nerds like to let you know exactly what they think of what they've just drunk yep absolutely um, absolutely so um you know it, but it, it was a great process we had this little black box and people would post their their um their post it their little coasters in there and we'd read them afterwards i think the most notable night was I did a green coffee bean saison, which oh, wow. I would stick with because you know we'd done we'd done a collaboration with People's Coffee doing a like a coffee bock, uh, which is a beer we still make called Dark Arts. Uh, so we'd done that, but while I was hanging out at the at the roastery, they had all these you know fresh green coffee beans, and I was like, wow, these they've just got a really unique smell. It's you know it's very different to finished coffee. It's incredibly kind of like spicy and fruity and i was like wow it'd be really interesting to see if you could capture that flavor in something like a saison so i made a saison put green coffee beans in it uh, and i was stoked because i got that flavor in there only problem being it turns out everyone really fucking hates that flavor <laughs> um, so you know one of the coasters that i got that night was what, what did it say this beer was disgusting you should have chucked it down the drain be a brewer not a chef and i was like <laughs> At the time, I was like, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit mean. Um, but then, I, I don't know, afterwards, I was like, well, you know, no, no, fuck it. Because, uh, you know, you, you need to push boundaries, I think. You need to yeah, absolutely. try new things because, you know, if you never try anything new, then, you know, you never make any progress. Uh, and it's always interesting that for beers like that, you know, especially 
it's not necessarily that difficult to make a beer that offends nobody. Uh, it's kind of, to me, sometimes more satisfying to make a beer that's quite polarizing because you'll find that there'll be people who hate it, but then for every hater, there'll be somebody who just loves it. You know, it's right up their alley. It's quite interesting. Fun. So, so you um, talked about yeah, that. About- yeah. Yeah, so you talked about there talk about, um, about pushing the boundaries and trying yeah. to make different beers. Um, I think one of the first things that, especially new people to Garage Project, and especially back when the bottles started popping up, even in Australia, I think uh, 2014, maybe, maybe a bit earlier, yeah. um, it was yeah, your yeah, labels. Yeah, well. I was say, we, we sent beer to Melbourne before we sent beer to Auckland. Yeah, right. Um, there we go. I think we felt, I mean, obviously, I knew Australia quite well. I'm very fond of it. Uh, and I think we felt that there was a real, there is, there's a real affinity between Wellington and Melbourne. Yep. The cultures are very similar. Obviously, the size is vastly different. But, you know, it's like Wellington is a little bit like somebody hit Melbourne with a shrink ray. Yeah, um, right. yeah. So, you know, we, we felt like there was that connection and we yeah. naturally just were sending beers there and they were received really well, which was great. Yeah. And I know one of the the first things that, you know, customers always notice with beers is the, is the labeling um, and Garage Project um, back then was, I think, one of the first breweries I'd seen using uh, artwork opposed to, a, you know, a core range that all look the same, maybe with slight color variances. Yeah. But you guys, Garage Project are always well known for their labeling. Um, you mentioned that Joss is from computer gaming design. Does, is that from him or where does that kind of unique labeling come from? Oh, well, so Joss and I still are like the creative team. We've got uh, Matt Sloan who works with us uh, and Tim who's done the art on quite a few beers and he's kind of like there as an artistic kind of director as well. So it's just a little team of four of us. And I think we we just come up with ideas. Quite often, you know, we have quite a strong sense of what we want in terms of the art. Uh, And then it's a matter of trying to track down the right artist um, I'm a strong believer that, you know, you start drinking a beer before you've opened the package. You know, you see something on the shelf yep. and it draws you in, you know, hopefully you, you have some kind of response to it. You turn it around, you read what's on the back of it. So I, I write the stuff on the, the bottles and cans still. So you read what it's about. I mean, it should be a story. It should draw you in. And then, you know, it's creating a holistic experience and then you open it up and pour it out. And fuck, it's so important that what's inside is awesome too because yeah, absolutely. drinkers aren't stupid. You know, they don't, it, you know, just because it looks good on the outside, you've got to, even more so, I think, you've got to back up what's on the inside. It's got to stand up to everything that you've said on the outside. I mean, it's interesting you say that we're so different to that kind of branded look. Somebody right at the very beginning of Garage Project was this marketing guru guy that we were chatting to. He was like, fuck, whatever you do, don't, don't do this. Don't do this art thing. You know, it'll be death for your brand. You've <laughs> got to be able to see your logo 15 feet away in a bar fridge. If you don't fucking do that, you're dead. Um, obviously, that was pretty terrifying at the time when we poured <laughs> everything into it. We were just like, well, no, 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 we're not going to do that because we, we're really excited about it. This changeable art, you know, it's it's just kind of fun. I think that is allowing you to do anything. It, you know, we, we I don't think we've ever felt like we're kind of painted into a corner. You can do anything in Garage Project. It's kind of fun. Um, so it's always that we, ignored, we ignored this person, and thank God we did. Because yeah. <laughs> So the um, yeah, obviously your labels um, and your beers were really well received. Um, for for a number of years, uh, but I think it was in 2015 uh, you experienced. Uh, rapid growth. Um, I think you were in the Deloitte uh, top fast 50. Um, yeah. and we, were, we were number one. We were the fastest number... growing business in New Zealand, what... which is pretty crazy, isn't it? That's um, it's, an, it's amazing and absolutely outstanding. Uh, but that would bring on its own new challenges. Um, I what think challenge... Actually, to be honest, we, we entered that year, uh, and we haven't entered any other year, but we've probably had that kind of growth you know, other years as well. It's been, does, that, does that rapid growth bring on new challenges, oh, especially coming from the, the just the three of you? Um, what, what, well, what challenges I mean, do you there's, face? A more, there's a lot more than three of us now. So, um, you know, uh, Ian's now head of the brew team at Aro, um, but, you know, we've got sort of, you know, five or six other brewers on the team there. Um, we've got our own salespeople. We've always 
done pretty much our own distribution because I don't know. We just get funny like that. We like to yep. own almost everything we can all the way down the line until it gets to a bar or a bottle shop. Yep. Um, but yeah, does it bring its own challenges? Hell yeah. God. I mean, you know, I don't think I ever imagined that it would be this big. Uh, I mean, I think talking about the benefits of it being big is that I, I didn't never really even consider just how cool it would be to create something that drew other cool people in. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah, it kind absolutely. Of, like a planet, it kind of develops its own gravity and it just seems like we've drawn other cool people into the business. And, you know, it's immensely satisfying. In, think- in New Zealand, we talk about, we talk about family, we talk about fun out, and, and there is like a real fun out in, in Garage Project. It's a, you know, it's a pretty close team. Uh, even though we're spread over two sites now. Um, Plus, we have this relationship with B Studio up in the Hawke's Bay, which is a contract facility that we basically partnered with them early on and helped them with the setup. And so we brew a few of our beers up there as well. Uh, But, yeah, immense challenges come with growth. Yeah, I can I could totally imagine. Um, and we're one big part of that growth. Uh, I think it was 2017. You opened where you are now, the Wild Workshop. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that's part of your, uh, you know, wild beers or the sour beers. But you also launched uh, natural wines. What? Yes. What was? What's the? I'm not. What's the now, idea behind natural to, wines? I have to lay down a quick disclaimer that I personally have a very rare form of attention deficit disorder that when anyone starts talking about wine, I kind of get bored and wander off. <laughs> um, but Joss is an enormous fan of natural wine. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is Joss's project. Is, I'm very supportive of it, but Joss, Joss does the natural wine. Um, yeah. And so, it, which is cool. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in it. It's very, it's very cool. Um, and so that's happening here. Uh, in the wild workshop as well, uh, as well yes. as we've got some some vines in the ground and, and around Nelson, which is the same area that that all the hops are growing as well. We keep ourselves busy. Absolutely. There's always something going on. Yes. Um, speaking of keeping yourself busy, um, you had, I think it was about a month ago now, maybe two months ago, um, your Happy Festival, which yeah. drew international praise for the brewery list. Um you know, the breweries that came out, I know in Australia, people were just jumping yeah. and heading over really there. Cool. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, what is you know, the Harpy Festival? What was that? What was the question? What is the Harpy Festival and how did you well, kind of get it together? Festival? Well, there are two layers to this. One is that, as I said, we keep ourselves very busy uh, and we are involved in what we call the, the Harpy Project, which, um, or Harpy Research, which is um, we've partnered with, uh, one of the hop farms down in Nelson uh, called Freestyle Farms um, to basically, it's quite a broad kind of idea, but we're very interested in looking at hop quality, in looking at trying to grow new hop varieties um, and really just, you know, play around and explore anything to do with hops. Um, so that's what Happy Research is. Um, we're in this amazing position in New Zealand where we grow these fantastic hops. Uh, and it also draws a list, like an, a, like an A-list of the most awesome brewers in the world are all drawn down here at Harvest. Um, you know, they come to check out the hops. And Freestyle this year um, are, were offering the chance for people to actually come and do lot selection, which is something they do in the yeah. States a lot, but has not really been available uh, in New Zealand. So it's a chance for you to come and you basically can try hop varieties picked on certain days from certain blocks and, and really choose exactly the kind of flavor uh, that you want to have in your beer because there is variation. Um, you know, it's not like any of them are shit, but it's like, you know, they, they, they vary. They have different kind of flavor profiles and you know what you're trying to achieve with a certain hop. Um, so all of these brewers are drawn down for the harvest uh, and it was Joss's idea. He was like, well, we've got all these amazing brewers coming. We know they're in town. Why don't we do a beer festival um, using them? And at the same time, we ran a symposium where we 
you know, a lot of the people coming down really are experts in their field, especially around using hops. Um, and it's part of the Harpy research is basically, you know, building this knowledge base about hops and how to use them and sharing it not just with Garage Project but with the, the brewing industry in general. So the symposium was basically open to all Kiwi brewers and Australian brewers were welcome to come as well. Anyone was welcome. Um, and we gave free tickets to Kiwi brewers. They came along and we just had this, this whole symposium, which was a mixture of hop growers, brewers, and scientists. And I think it's really cool to get all of those people together in one room because, you know, there hasn't necessarily been a lot of communication between these different people. And I think it's immensely useful for hop growers to know what brewers want, for brewers to know what's going on on a hop farm, and for everyone to sit there and, you know, soak up some of the really interesting scientific stuff that's happening because it will have follow-on effects in how we use our hops in beers and how we grow hops in the first place. So, you know, I think it went super well. I think everyone enjoyed it. And I can only imagine that it's going to get more and more exciting next year and the following year as we grow it. And then you did. Uh, and then, of course, it was a giant piss up afterwards. You know, <laughs> which, so. With all the punters come to. And I guess for people that uh, didn't get there, or actually have, might not have heard of it, um, some of the breweries that actually, you know, I'm looking at a list now, and, you know, the breweries are a who's who of the top uh, craft breweries, you know, Hill Farmstead, Cloudwater, Firestone Walker, Modern Times, yeah. Other Half, The Bale. A lot of, a lot of cool kids. Yeah. And, and in most cases, you know, you had the actual brewer there manning the tap, pulling the beer, which is, um, you know, I think it's a pretty cool opportunity. That was pretty awesome. And we did it in Te Papa. So I don't know if anyone, if you've been to Wellington, you've probably been to Te Papa. It's the, um, the National Museum. And it's yeah, just that's great. Amazing incredible space like kind of like a cathedral um it was amazing i mean uh, so matty uh handles all of our events at the garage project and we do a lot of them between gabs Birvana, and now the harpy festival it was incredible so the last the, the museum was open to the public all day uh and we held the symposium during the day there and then the doors shut we had one and a half hours and we managed to get this beer festival set up in that time. It was just remarkable. Matty's just incredible. Just this, everything was just so organised. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. That amazing. That um, was, it was super cool. And then the last thing that came from the festival is, I know we're super excited yeah. for this. We haven't got them yet. They're on uh, the shipping container, probably halfway across. Um, right. but your collaboration, Happy Sessions. Yeah. Um, so that was the idea of the sessions were, you know, like like kind of jazz sessions, like playing, you know, in jazz, you'll have a jazz standard and then like people get together and they riff and, and play and you end up with these incredible kind of permutations on a theme. So with each of the breweries and the breweries were Firestone Walker, uh, Other Half from New York, uh, Trillium uh, and Three Weavers from LA. Uh, so... I, I feel like each of those breweries, I picked them or we picked them because I feel like they are basically top of their game with different styles. Yep. Uh, and so for each brewery, we kind of picked one of their beers that is kind of that quintessential style. Uh, and then we just, we riffed on it and we used Kiwi hops instead of American or a blend of them. Um, fresh from harvest. All of them were from the lot selection that we did down at Freestyle. Uh, and and just came up with these beers, and they're all awesome. Uh, all I can't, totally I different. can't wait. And the hype yeah. in Australia is going off for them. Like we have, well, we've I, currently got to be absolutely honest. The Aro Street, the Trillium one, has sold out here. Uh, uh, I yeah. went to get one the other day, and I was like, oh fuck it, <laughs> it's very gone already. Um, it's I, sucked down. So yeah, I guess Pretty last cool. but not least, um, for Garage Project, um, yeah. what can we see? Is, are you working on any new projects, or what? What can we see in the future? We are always, you know, I mean that the twenty four twenty four obviously sounds hectic. You know, doing twenty four beers in twenty four weeks. I think we've broken that record. Wow! Every year that we've done it, we we produce far more than that now, especially now that we've got wine on top. So it's, you know, I mean, it is a non stop frenetic pace producing all of these new things. Um, obviously, we've got Aro Street producing kind of clean beer, 
uh, but hopefully, you know, experimental, interesting. Uh, we've got uh, Marion Street, which is now, you know, after it's a couple of years old now, but it's finally starting to produce beer. You know, we've got over 90,000 90, litres of sour beer sitting in barrel here. Wow. Um, and it's really starting to come out now. So we're able to produce some, some fascinating things coming out of here, which is really exciting. You can imagine, like, waiting for this, <laughs> waiting for a couple of years to actually be able to release something. This makes you sweat bullets. Um, and then we've got, obviously, natural wine as well on top of it, um, which I've got to say is being super well received in Australia. It's really cool. It's, uh, um, so I'm trying to think of any, any particular projects. I mean, we're working on uh, an entirely native saison uh, at Marion Street uh, using Totara barrels. So Totara is like a native timber that they used to use yeah. to make wine barrels. Yeah, um, cool. We managed to secure a wine barrel, a massive, like, you know, a couple of thousand litre wine barrel, very old one, and we'll be doing that. Um Gosh, a whole range of really cool stuff. Never stops. Um, and then, of course, we've got Bivana coming. So, you know, that's always an opportunity for us to really just go to town. Um, I think it's been our philosophy from the very beginning that people come to festivals, they've paid quite a lot of money to get in, they really deserve something kind of special. Yep. Um, there's no point in just turning up to a festival and there being the same beers you can get any other day of the week at a pub on tap. You know, uh, you want something fun, outlandish. I mean, it's a beer festival too, so you want big flavours because your palate's like just getting overwhelmed. There's so many different things happening. So we always try and bring our A game to festivals like that. I think Gab's, uh, we've had Gab's Melbourne. It was super successful. It was really fun. We had layered beers and fresh IPAs. And um, we'll be trying to do something even more exciting uh, for Bivana this year. I mean, it's, it's fun too. Yeah, absolutely. This should all be fun. I mean, that's, I think that's our number one philosophy at Carriage Pro Day. As long as we're still having fun. I mean, obviously, it's stressful and, um, you know, frenetic. But it's got to be fun. Um because if it's fun for us, then hopefully it's fun for everybody else. I think that's the uh, underlying message from all the uh, Garage Project beers you ever had. There's always that sense of fun. Yeah, um, good. But thank you so much today for taking your time out. So I'm sure you're always busy. Um, but for sitting down and having yeah. a chat, getting people those little inside stories that they might not know. Uh, to everyone, uh, keep drinking the Garage Project beers. They're always fantastic. And thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Lachlan. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Garage Project first appeared in the Australian market back in 2014 and enjoyed much success to date. I managed to catch up with the Australian National Sales Manager Adam Holiday at Gab Sydney to discuss the rise of Garage Project in Australia. Hey everyone, I am currently in the mid-session break of Gab Sydney 2019. I'm sitting down with Adam Holiday, the National Sales Manager of Garage Project. Thanks for joining me. No worries, thanks for having us. So Garage Project previously in Australia was imported by Phoenix Beverages. Yep. Um, however, as Pete alluded to earlier in the interview, Garage Project are really passionate about having control of the entire business. So they hired yourself in 2017? Yeah, correct. I came on board in uh, July 2017. Um, so yeah, we've been doing, I've been with the guys for just over, or just under two years now. Um, and then since then, the team's really grown. So we've got a Victorian sales rep as well as Kane, who looks after New South Wales for us. Um, and all of that's with that uh, idea of not just having control over where the beer goes, but also the relationships that we have. We um, very relationship focused brewery. Um, and the idea is to have feet on the ground to help build those relationships. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think having you know a, a rep on the ground really helps with that relationship between breweries, bar, bottle shops as well. Um, you know. One thing that Garage Projects is, is very heavy on is you know limited releases and all that. Australian beer market is very he heavy on those. Yeah. Um, how does that? How do you find that with? Is that easy to sell into um, the Australian market, or how do you find that? Yeah, uh, I think the the response to the the limited releases has been really strong, and we're really appreciative of I guess uh, people like you guys and Beer Cartel selling everything through, and the response on like CBC and Beer Thread and other forums. Um, we've got to remember that. Wellington, New Zealand is a population of about 4 million, which is the population of Sydney or Melbourne. Um, so when we do get in those limited releases, the response is fantastic and we really do love and appreciate that. 
um, the, the challenge for us for growth is around getting those core range or ongoing yeah. beers moving through. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. With the core range, um, one of the the challenges I guess with the Australian beer market is there's been a really big push for local. Um, beers, yeah. uh, you know, Sydney in Sydney or Melbourne breweries in Melbourne. How do you yeah. find that being a, you know, a, I guess technically an international, but obviously yeah. our closest neighbour. Yeah. How do you find that being a New Zealand brewery coming into Australia? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, there are some challenges, and I, I think the other big thing that's happened over the last two years and even before all that, um, the quality of beer coming from local Australian breweries just keeps growing at an exponential rate, um, and it, it, it's got to that point uh, where it's not even just about buying a local Australian beer it can be like literally buying a, a local New South Wales beer or a beer from the inner west depending on where you live in Sydney um, so for us it's about finding uh, the beers that might fit that aren't going to be as uh, saturated so we are pretty excited that things like White Mischief and Cereal Milk Stout um, their beers are going to become ongoing parts of the range for Australia um, so as opposed to trying to attack the uh, I guess the pale ale or the IPA market which is pretty saturated and competitive uh, whilst we stand behind those beers, I think there's some other op- exciting opportunities for us with beers that uh, maybe are a little less prevalent in terms of style to have like an ongoing. So, White Mischief and Cereal Milk are going to be launched as six packs soon in Australia. Um, so, they're beers that we're going to put a lot of energy behind. Um, but we're also pretty excited to have things like Pernicious Weed and DFA available year round that we know can be here in 10 days at a cold ship. So, we stand behind the quality of the product as well. As the, uh, the music currently gets louder <laughs> in around the gabs in the mid-session, yeah. um, the last question I want to ask you is, um, I know originally the, the beers were only uh, shipped into Melbourne itself, and then yeah. they kind of got bought up from Melbourne into Sydney. Yeah. Now the beers get shipped into Melbourne and Sydney, so like you said, 10 days yeah. uh, between canning and on the shelves of bottle shops, which is insane. Yeah. Um, can we expect more of that into other states, in other suburbs, into, you know, into the the expansion into Australia itself and even into further into the into the world. What, what do you think for, for Garage Projects? So for, yeah, for Australia, like, uh, so just to clarify, it's 10 days shipping as opposed to death. Whilst we try and get it as tight <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, like, yeah. coming off the canning line and then being here, so some stuff that will hit Australia will be two and a half weeks and it's on the shelf. Some of it might be four to six. Um, but, yeah. Still very fresh. Still very fresh and, that's, that's a, and, and transported correctly as well and stored, refrigerated. Um, So yeah, there's a shipment comes in every month to Melbourne, shipment comes in every month to Sydney. We've just started doing uh, drop shipments into Brisbane as well. We do drop shipments into Melbourne, uh, into uh, Perth and Adelaide. Um, We're probably a little way off having direct shipments into Perth and Brisbane. That's it. We're all about organic growth as opposed to just chucking some stock in there and hoping it moves through. We prefer to almost at that three and a half week month part of the month run out of stock and then have a shipment coming through. Um, so yeah, Bris- Brisbane and I guess Perth are the next two areas that we'll probably look to for direct shipping, but that that could be anywhere from six to twelve months away, to be honest. So, but we're, we're, we're very very appreciative of the response that we're getting around Australia. Last question, as I uh, let you go back to the Gabs and have a break between sessions, yeah. um, you're pouring some pretty unique beers, including one that was specifically air freighted over within what a couple of days of being uh, kegged. Yeah. Um, what's been the reaction of your Gabs beers? Um, yeah. Whenever, uh, and it's our, I guess it's our rule, if you're going to pay a t- pay for your ticket uh, and you're going to come to a festival, GP's going to put on a show. Um, so yeah, as an example of that, uh, it's June 1st today for Gab Sydney. So in Melbourne, we, we poured uh, Fresh May, which is part of our monthly Hazy IPA series. Uh, but it's June 1st, so we couldn't really pour Fresh May for that. So we decided that we'd air freight over some kegs of uh, June Fresh. So they are officially being launched in Australia here and exclusively for Sydney Gabs at the same time they're being launched over in uh, New Zealand and the response has been absolutely amazing so lots of uh, lots of full glasses and excited punters yeah the Gabs line was incredibly long and I think you sold out most of your kegs yeah it was relentless uh, and that and that's like we said like this is why we come to these kind of things the response from uh, the general public is is what keeps us coming back for these um, there's four of us working the stand for about 12 hours straight and it, it's just the energy that you get off everyone coming up being excited asking about all the different beers it's fantastic if you're ever out there I highly recommend that you get any of their beers but uh, I'll let you get back to the Gabs Festival thank you so much for joining me for anyone out there uh, once again get your Gab, uh, the Garage Project beers if you can find any of the the, uh, the Gabs beers out there definitely recommend trying them but thank you so much for joining me and have a good Gabs absolute pleasure and thanks to you and the, the team from Beer Cartel and everyone in Australian Craft Beer for supporting us we really appreciate it cheers guys cheers 
I hope you enjoyed this insight into one of the world's premier craft breweries. Let us know what you think of Garage Project at our Facebook group, the Beer Cartel's Craft Beer Collective. If you'd like to continue to stay up to date with the latest from the craft beer industry, please hit subscribe at either iTunes Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. That's it for today. I'll see you next time.